Well, good afternoon. Who does not love a good afternoon or lunchtime webinar? Thanks everybody for joining us today. We are going to be talking about my favorite topic of the year and what I'm doing all my speaking on, hacking the supply chain. Uh, kind of a weird name for a presentation, but I hope that in the next uh, 25 minutes or so, it's gonna make total sense and uh, we're going to uh, give you some some food for thought and some things you can work on inside your organization. So my name is John Stingle. I'm president and CEO of JSCM Group. I've been with JSCM Group now over 20 years. I was doing cybersecurity before it was cool, and I go back uh, quite some time um, in the industry. I don't know it all, but one of the areas that I do know quite a lot about is infrastructure, continuity, and incident response planning. So. I'm um, going to give you some things to think about and some outside the box things to think about. One of the things I really hope that one of your takeaways are from this session is that you don't deal with this just inside of your IT departments or your security departments. I want to see you work on these things inside of your organization as a whole. I recently attended the Black Hat uh, conference out in Vegas and uh, some a lot of good insights as always. One of the things that they did spend a lot of time talking about is that security is no longer just another role of IT. It's no longer just another role inside of an organization. Cybersecurity involves every department across the entire organization. And the reason that is, is that everybody is involved when a cybersecurity incident occurs. So if you think about it, if um, inside your organization, if there's a cybersecurity attack, or against your payroll company. They're unable to process payroll. That now kind of affects the entire organization, right? Or if your largest supplier has a cybersecurity incident, that's gonna affect shipments of products. It's gonna affect staffing levels inside of warehouses. So we have to start to think about cybersecurity and our suppliers kind of in the same conversation. It's not just, well, you have the budget to get the latest EDR or EPP, or you hired an organization to do a cybersecurity test and they came back with some recommendations. That's not where the cybersecurity conversation needs to stop. So let's just talk about some, some pitfalls that we see inside of most organizations as we're doing our testing um, inside of them. And one of the things we have to say is you can trust absolutely no one, even your friendly cybersecurity consulting company. And the reason you don't want 100% trust is that if it is your job inside of the company or, or, the, or the organization in order to protect what's coming into the network and what, what connections are allowed. And if you're, if you're uploading data or if there's VPN connections from suppliers, they all have access to certain components of your business. And this is what we consider the software, cybersecurity, and hardware supply chains. We're reliant on those various third parties to do our day-to-day -day work, for example, right? So we've got phones, we've got so software vendors, we have application vendors, we have shipping companies, we have suppliers, we have all these, these different organizations, and we are actually are dependent on their cybersecurity as well. Great common story goes way back, and I hate to always use it, but it's a really, really good one, and that is that of Target. The Target breach that took place almost a decade ago now is one of the earliest major cybersecurity supply chain attacks that we saw, and how they accessed Target, how they were able, the attackers were able to gain access to Target was through their HVAC vendor. So in technical terms, how that worked is the HVAC vendor needed a connection, a VPN connection inside to the Target network in order to maintain the HVAC systems on the, on the network. The Target was doing a very, very bad practice of network segmentation through IP subnets, which basically means that they had different IP addresses on the HVAC systems, but they weren't actually technically separated. Attackers were able to very, very quickly figure this out that, hey, once we got access inside a target, we can now see the entire infrastructure. They were then able to deploy their uh, key logging packages and, and, and the other things that they use in order to steal all this credit card. This came from a need from building operations to maintain HVAC systems. 
from there, the, the attackers just took over. And the reason I say you don't even want to trust your friendly cybersecurity company 100% is you don't want to trust your, your managed service provider. You don't want to trust anybody who has technical access inside your network because they can be hit too. In fact, suppliers, third parties that are providing services to major corporations, small businesses, governments, they're actually the largest attack surface right now. They're the ones undergoing the most the most attention from the attackers because if you gain access to one you can gain access to many 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 organizations don't realize this we saw this last year with the Kaseya attacks Kaseya is a, a remote management system that many IT companies use once they were able to gain access to Kaseya the attackers were then had access to everybody who they had credentials inside of Kaseya so we need to start to think about this, but I don't want to just focus on the IT side. We have to look at the organization as a whole. We have seen some really, really nasty ransomware attacks uh, this year, our organization. And there's a lot in the market. There's new um, types of ransomware that are being updated. Uh, we have now a block bit 3.0. Um, we, we have seen the recent rise in, in Black Basta. We have seen Red, Red Alert, seeing Maui a little bit. There's a lot of different ones out there. And AV software can detect some of these, but not all of them. Where we can also see very targeted, limited things is like saying that a database server that hosted a software vendor got hit. And now an organization is no longer able to use that particular function. So ransomware is very very common it is not the only way sometimes ransomware isn't the solution if you work in local government small government in many states it is now illegal for you in the state or against the law however you want to say it for you to pay the ransom so we're seeing not so much an attention on ransomware inside of, of government we're seeing different types of attacks being launched against those organizations we're seeing the ransomware attacks focus on organizations who can actually pay the goal is to get you to pay the money. So they're going to go to where and who is going to pay them the most money. So depending on the vendor and depending on the supplier is going to, going to dictate a little bit how that attack is going to look. It's going to dictate also what your risk is going to be. So a lot of conversations need to happen inside of the organization over what we have, what we're using, and what is going to be subject to um, shutting us down. What do we need to run our business? What is the key? So if I'm an attacker, I'm going to switch the mindset here a little bit. If I'm an attacker, my goal is to shut down key suppliers. So I'm going to do phishing tests. I'm going to use LinkedIn. I'm going to build my OSINT list. I'm going to target organizations. And I could stumble on somebody, let's just say an accounting firm. So it's a large accounting firm. They deal with a lot of mid-sized organizations, got some government clients in there. We're going to focus on them and we're going to see what we have access to. And as we're digging through the network, we are digging through the OSINT information. The, um, the, and OSINT is the ability to gather information that's public and then use that to conduct phishing tests or other ways to social engineer your way into a network. So um, we're going to target this, this third-party accounting firm and then once we get access to that network, we're really not going to do anything. And one of the mistakes people make is that they're always waiting for a red light to go off. They're always waiting for something to alert, hey, somebody's inside of your network. Well, once a real good adversary gains access to a network, you don't know it. In fact, our average time they sit inside of a network is six months. They're not launching attacks. They're not encrypting files. What they're doing is they're gathering additional information. They're using practices that the IT department has put in place to navigate around the network. They're gaining more information. They're making their notes. They're gathering the stuff. And then they launch the attack. This is what we saw with Colonial Pipeline, for example. That was all gained through a phishing attack. Then they sat quietly. They waited until they had all their ducks in a row. The same thing is going to happen with this, this, this fictional accounting firm I'm talking about. They're going to gain access. And they're going to see who they have access to. Maybe they're going to try to get a client list. And they're going to say, oh, I've got access to XYZ Racing. 
And man, those guys got a lot happening every weekend. They've got a lot of races coming up. So they're going to continue to dig. They're going to continue to dig in that information. And they're going to say, wait a second. It looks like we have access to their accounting database. But I got to be sure this is the current database and not the old database. So the attackers will get into the database. They're going to make some notes. They're going to figure out, okay, this is what the account balances are. Here's just a few key pieces of information. Let's come back in a few days. Attackers go away. Then they come back into the network in a few days. How do they come back in the network in a few days? Because once they were in there the first time, they planted a back door that allows them access anytime that they want. The attacker goes and they come back in a few days and it says, sure enough, I can get into that database. And the database data has changed. That means this most likely is the live version of the database. So they do some more research and they determine that there is a connection coming from this other IP address that is accessing this database and all this is done through logs. So then they hop on, they follow that connection, they pull that string to, and they find their way into the email of this racing firm's primary contact. They use that email to send an email to this racing firm to get more information. Again, they're gathering information. It's benign. It doesn't look suspicious at this point. They're gathering, they're gathering it. And then the supplier says, well, I need you to update your passwords. So we make sure we have everything. Email looks like, yeah, sure. I'm going to update the password. Got to be secure. They do that. The attacker makes note of the new password because the supplier doesn't use MFA. They don't require MFA in order to connect to this network. Hacker knows this. Hacker continues to watch this. They're paying attention. They get into the racing company's network. Then on a Friday before the NASCAR championship comes up, they decide to pull the trigger. And they spread an entire attack across the entire network, locking all the computers. At that point, they throw up their demand to say, hey, you've got to pay. And if you don't pay, we're going to release your data, all this bad stuff. You're not going to get it back. So good luck. Now, we have a problem. We have to decide, are we going to pay this in reasonable ransom demand, or are we going to let this sit, and are we going to do something? The company makes a decision, well, we're going to have to, we're going to, you know, we don't believe in paying. We're not going to pay the attackers. We're good. We, we need access to our data, but we're going to do it from a restore. They tell the attacker to go to hell. They go, they say, okay, fine, whatever. Company goes to restore the data and they can't restore. Turns out they never tested that backup. They missed one little step. They thought the data was good. They were getting positive backup messages, but it wasn't good. And now they can't restore the data. And now it is Saturday morning. They have a race in six hours. They have to figure something out. So what do they do? And those hard choices are what we have to face every day. Because if you don't do what they say, sometimes the worst can happen and the situation gets way worse. And now it becomes very public, very messy, very ugly. And this is how they get paid. Now let's go back to my fictional story. The beginning of it, all they did was send a phishing message to somebody that worked at an accounting firm. And they were able to shut down another company who needed the data. And because they still have access to that accounting firm, they're now going to hit every other client they can, and they're going to rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat until eventually that accounting firm figures out they're the source, and then they clean it up. And then the attackers move on to the next supplier. Who we do business with matters, and how we do business with them matters. We can't necessarily trust them. They could be the best accounting firm in the world, but when an attacker penetrates these third-party systems and you have allowed them access into your network, you're giving them the you're giving them the blueprint to attack your network. And IT was never involved in the decision to work with that accounting firm, and IT was never involved in the connection 
to the accounting database. All you did was provide the infrastructure of the accounting database to put the accounting database on, and now you are your entire network is shut down through this vendor that you never vetted. It's not necessarily IT's fault until the day there's ransomware, and then they're going to say, it's your fault. You guys have to fix this. I, we often use this example of the MSP attacks, which is a real, real, really bad risk. You've got to caution everybody against using um, MSPs having full admin access to a network. That's a whole other webinar and how you can protect yourself against those kind of things. But um, we, we do, that is not the only example. And that's the, that's the point I want to make upon this because everybody can have an MSP type situation. Everybody can have somebody fired from a supplier that then can cause bad stuff in the network. They can then launch ransomware. They can then gain access to this, but it goes far beyond simply technical, like I said. The vastness of the suppliers inside your organization are greater than you even realize. Even if you're the owner, you would have to sit down and really think about who all I'm dependent on to conduct normal business operations. Who all matters? Who all do I have access to? And the truth is, regardless of what you've done, no network is 100% safe. It never is. The attacks are diverse. They're coming from so many different sources. We're trusting our users with email, which then allows phishing, and you have to then have other controls in place. And we're trusting our suppliers with the same thing. We're focused on that. When I get an email from a key supplier that I have worked with for years, I'm naturally more at ease, just like your other employees inside your organization are, just like people inside your IT department are. We're very, very relaxed in that. And when your boss is demanding you to con make a connection to a supplier or to provide access to a supplier, you are in a position of saying, whoa, hang on a second. I have to make this connection. What do I need to do to make it work? And then you can moan and grumble like, this is really insecure. This is really a bad practice. You can tell your boss that, but when the day comes that those attacks get launched and that you find out that there's something wrong, they're going to forget those conversations ever, ever took place. Absolutely, everybody is at risk. We attack uh, or an attacker attacks organizations for different reasons, and we defend against them differently. So, for example, like I said, in government, many cases are not allowed to pay. So the, the, the goals in there are more hacktivism related. They're more like sometimes want to shut something down. Sometimes it's political in nature. Sometimes like we saw in Florida where they mess with the chemicals in the water in order to spread terror. There's so many different attacks in so many different ways. Manufacturing, they like to get into I, IoT devices. Uh, if you work in the pharmaceutical industry, for example, a very common thing is they like to get in there and make the shut down like, like temperature readings or try to adjust HVAC systems to destroy a batch of, of of uh, pharmaceuticals that are being produced. Sometimes in retail, we're just very, very focused on credit cards. Although that's not a huge thing right now. Uh, we're more going after the overall retailer. And then there's always a threat if you don't get paid. Let's just say your law firm gets attacked. And by the way, law firms are the worst offenders of bad security practices. They do almost nothing because they say it's your fault for doing business with us. It's the craziest business in the world. But let's just say your law firm gets attacked. What secrets do they know about your organization? What is sensitive for them? What is sensitive in order for them that you don't want to get information released? So like I said, move past some of these. One of the, one of the best things we do is don't attack an individual organization. Go after the suppliers. Get access to multiple organizations. Shut them down in mass and get access to hundreds or thousands of them at the exact same time. Some of them are going to pay. Some of them won't. It doesn't take many of them to pay to call that a successful attack. You can attack one organization, get four or five to pay. You can walk away with a $20 million payday. It doesn't take very much. So we definitely think about that. So the, let's get to the point. Enough examples. How do we avert supplier risk? How can we mitigate this for our organization? And one of the main things is, we say it a lot lately, principle of least privilege, let's just go and cause ZTNA. 
but it's hard to do ZTMA, zero trust network access. We can't really do that to our suppliers. So we have to adopt the principle of least privilege. We have to learn how to silo and connect our networks in such a way that the data truly is sectioned off. So you're forced to allow the phone system the phone vendor access into your network. They need to be able to manage it. They need to be able to get in there to make their software changes. That has to happen. They also have to have connections in order to get out to the internet, to get your, your SIP services working. That's a necessary thing. HVAC systems have to be online. What do we do? We build in really, really good, strong VLANs and segmentation, and then write access control lists that prevent you to get back and forth across that network. We, we want to go ahead and make sure that that access is limited and then tested by a third party to make sure that, hey, we can't see something across this. The reason you use a third party, not an internal party, is you may make sure it's good internally. The reason you use a third party is you want to make sure they can't see it from the outside. You need to be able to test it from the outside. And this applies, like I said, to software application vendors, IT companies, everybody. So we want to adopt that zero trust privilege. We also want to make sure that who we do business with has really, really good liability insurance. You guys should be working inside your companies to create vendor onboarding forms. This is a process we're going through right now. We're going through our SOC 2 compliance. And as one of the things to point out is we need better vendor security practices. So what we're doing is all of our vendors now are on, this, on a chopping block. And we're saying, okay, you have to now meet this standard and if you don't, we're gonna to have to do business with somebody else. We're also saying for anything that's key, any key vendor, we need to have a redundant vendor in place. So key suppliers, and then we have backup suppliers. And I always like to use a rule of percentages. Let's just say I'm in the, I'm in the beef industry and I get 100% um, of my seed from one supplier. So I can grow my hay. Well, that's not, that's not necessarily very smart, right? Although they may be my preferred, I need to maintain relationships with other seed vendors. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna adjust the power, I'm gonna do some ratios. I'm gonna say, okay, 70% of my seed purchases are gonna go from one, 15 from another and 15 from another. Now I've got relationships already existing with three different suppliers. That way if something happens to one, I can go ahead and continue. I don't have to set up a new account or arrange for shipment. I've done that. So if you go through and work with your department leads on all of their key suppliers, you can start to make this list and then educate them that you need backups here, you need backups there, or you're really solid here, but check their liability insurance. Have this, do this work across your departments, not inside the IT office. It's not going to do you any good. Make sure that you're building in redundancies, you're, do, you're, you're building in a zero trust and you're working with them to make sure they've got the necessary things in place and that there's an insurance policy in place. So that accounting firm I used in my fictitious example is now liable because they had access to all this. And if you are one of those organizations who maintains access to client systems, you need to have a cyber liability policy in place that protects you against an attack inside and protect your clients to make sure that they're good. I don't think insurance is always necessary or the best way to go necessarily, but it is something that's in place that you may need. And to get insurance now is a little bit tougher. Cybersecurity insurance isn't as easy to get as it was many years ago. You have to meet certain standards. That's not a bad thing. One of those standards is you have to have testing in some cases. One of those standards is that you have to have MFA in place in order to, to mitigate a lot of like, like email security risks and stuff like that. This is the healthiest process you're gonna go through. It's gonna be frustrating and you're gonna realize where you're weak, but just like my trainer says, that means that we need to work on that area tougher. Until I go to my trainer and I fail at something, I'm unable to work out that kink in that problem. Third-party testing is another key ingredient to this as well. Third-party testing tells me that, okay, let me check me. Make sure I didn't miss anything here. Great example is who does our, who does our accounting internally is not who files our tax returns. They're not who advises us on, 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 on accounting methods. We use outside parties for that. Yes, we're an organization that does that, and we do believe in that, but there is value to it because we can see your network clearer than everybody else. And the other thing you can be asking is, are your, are your vendors undergoing this third party testing? If you have a key supplier, let's just say an accounting firm, a legal firm, and they're not getting 
annual testing by third parties, they're putting you at risk. They're putting your organization at risk. They need to undergo third party testing and you can request it and demand it. You can't do business with some banks unless you're doing this because they, the banks have an obligation to protect their users, to protect, I'm sorry, to protect their clients. That's where this comes down to is that the third party testing that you're requiring them to do make sure that your information is safe with them. If you're an organization that has health insurance, you offer health insurance to your employees, who are you giving that information to? Are they protecting your employees? Because if they lose it, you're putting your employees' personal identifying information at risk. Their families at risk. We have domino effects from this. And if we're not requiring anything of them, we're not going to ever hit the standard of making our employees, our users, our data more secure. A great example is we have to fire one of our client or one of our vendors. They're unable to hit a bare minimum standard. We have no choice unless we drop our standards. And why would I do that for somebody when there's somebody else who can do the same thing? Have that standard, develop that vendor document. It's going to be endlessly, endlessly beneficial for you. And if you're under compliance, this stuff is required. It is required for you to have this. It is required for you to identify these critical critical items and it is, it is necessary for you in order to better protect your organization. The last thing that I didn't include in here and I should have, and I'm sorry, but one of the other things you need to do is you need to develop an incident response plan, not some stock item that you get off the internet. You need to develop one that's, that involves department leads that know everything that's important to them and you need to gain access to all their data, say, okay, what's important to you in the county? What's important to you in manufacturing? What's important to you in operations? And gather all that. What software is key? What's important? Develop a priority list. Develop scenarios, do tabletop workthroughs and exercises to say, okay, when something happens, when a bad day happens, what are we going to do? Because what you don't want to be doing is walk in one day, all your computer screens are locked and not have a plan. Because th your departments are going to be shocked when you say our downtime could be 21 days. And that is not an absurd statistic. Or you won't be able to process checks for two weeks. Or you won't be able to run time clock data. You won't be able to onboard new employees. Or you won't be able to ship product. This isn't crazy. It's not science fiction. This happens every single day. And one of the hardest parts is when an attack happens, when an incident happens is that you don't have a plan and you're scrambling and you, the IT teams are stuck in the middle, having a, a finger pointing as everyone's priorities are top and you're just trying to get the network back up and running. A plan gives you that. Don't wait for your suppliers to get hit. They will get hit. Require some standards of them have them meet a spec. If you have questions on it, we can help you build out what those vendor documents look like. But your organization has to buy into this. It's not just about how you do it in IT. You don't have enough insight. You just don't. You, your job is to support an organization who does something else. Unless you're in the process of providing IT support, your job is to is to support an organization. Their priorities are going to be varied and they have suppliers. You can be the leader in this. You can be the champion of this inside your organization to build out the plans necessary to tr teach them how to hold their vendors to a standard and be that organization that survives an incident. Don't be that organization that can't make it. Don't be that organization that's crippled and loses revenue and has to lay off people because they didn't survive something. Thank you so much for your time. I sincerely appreciate it. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to us. You can always work with uh, our team. I'll be happy to personally speak with you. Um, love to talk about this topic. We have to start thinking of security outside of ourselves. We have to start thinking of it as part of our entire ecosystem. And this has to become a company problem. It can't just be an IT department problem or a security team problem. It is greater than that. It affects everybody, including your employees, including your clients. We can do better and we can hold our vendors to a standard. And when we do, everybody becomes better off and safer. So thank you so much for your time. I uh, hope you enjoyed the content. Again, please reach out to me or my team with any questions. We'd love to talk about this more.